Every Night is Game Night, Episode 67, Dragonfire and Massive Darkness. Hey everybody, welcome back to Every Night is Game Night. This is Anthony once again with Jason. Yo, my peoples, what's up? All right, and because we had so much fun last week, Colin from One Stop Co-op Shop is back. Hey everybody. All right, so we're going to be talking about two big games this week, fantasy themes, just two this time, guys. Um, first up, we have Dragonfire, which Jason had a chance to play after I multiple times failed to learn how to play it. And <laughs> <laughs> Got Ma- you back, buddy. Yeah, yes, thanks for bailing me out on that one. And then uh, Massive Darkness, the most recent shipped Kickstarter from Simon, um, the uh, fantasy update to Zombicide and all that goodness. So we'll see how that one plays solo as well. Okay, so I'm going to start, as Anthony said, with Dragonfire. Uh, this was designed by Randall Bills and a whole lot of people. I have a feeling they credited all the people who made Shadowrun Crossfire as well. Uh, published by Catalyst Games, which also published Shadowrun Crossfire. Uh, the reason why I mentioned that game is because this game is the reiteration of Shadowrun Crossfire. Um, so Shadowrun Crossfire, good game. Uh, has a reputation. If you uh, look, listen to our top 100, I gave Kevin Erskine a little bit of garbage about the fact that he played it and he put it on solitaire games in your table, and you know people started playing it because he did. There's <laughs> a couple of other people, um, but not really didn't have that impact that uh, it had in the broader gaming community. Um, so they re-implemented this. They got a DD license, uh, and they they're throwing it out there as this new product. What this game promises, at least from the start. Uh, one thing people know about Shadowrun was that it was really hard. Like in, well, there was that it was really hard number one, and that the leveling system was like drip, drip, drip. So not only did you lose a lot, you got barely got a lot of XP for it. So you just so it was a leveling system, and you stickered up your characters, and you leveled up, and you barely ever got any XP, and it was just you you had your soul crushed frequently. Uh, is this game better? So let's let's check it out. Uh, okay, so. Just like both of them, uh, this game's a deck building game um, in the sense that you have a dinky little hand of cards to start that barely do anything. Uh, they really don't do anything. Uh, they're just a, the barest minimum of stuff. Um, these cards come in four suits corresponding with four classes in the game, which are devotion cla- slash clerics, deception slash rogues, martial slash fighters, and arcane slash wizards. So you get the four core D&D classes represented by colors in your cards. Um, if you, you will start with more martial cards. If you're martial, basically that's basically it. Uh, so really dinky little hand of cards, just like any, any deck builder. So then once you have your dinky little, um, set of cards, you're going to get dealt a monster. So the monsters, uh, if you're in D and D fan, you're going to, you're going to make, going to be pretty happy. Uh, you get slods, you get stone giants, you get ropers, you get all the basic hits. Uh, each character is going to get dealt the monster, has hit points, and I'll go over how all that works in a second. Just want to give you a sense for how the game looks visually on the table. As you kind of look at how to deal with these monsters, the monsters on the right-hand side of their cards are going to have a row of symbols that are going to correspond to the cards in your hand. So if you have a uh, deception card that has a little red symbol, the monster will have a red symbol if it takes deception to kill it. So you play that card. Uh, it does one symbol of damage, and that's how you're going to kill it. So you have to play cards in a combination. Deception, you know, two uh, regular cards, an arcane. I think, like, visually you're supposed to imagine, like, a rogue backstabs from behind, and then the, the fighter just jabs it with his uh, axe, and then the, the, the mage just kind of fires up a fireball, and, like, a boom, 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 you get this multi-leveled, um, you know, a wave wave of attacks, which is actually a pretty cool visual. But meanwhile, on the on the the in the game... You're playing cards <laughs> and you're matching symbols. So that's kind of the basics of the game. You're going to play cards. You're going to beat these monsters. Hopefully you're going to beat the monsters. The monsters give you money. And then the deck building comes, which is you buy cards from the market. So the market, standard market, uh, you know, has six cards or five cards, depending on how many people you play with. Uh, you will uh, buy a card and the guard goes directly into your hand. So unlike a lot of deck builders, you may be thinking Aeon Zen. You may be thinking uh, Legendary. doesn't go into your discards. It goes into your hand. To balance that, you draw very few cards. Uh, so if you have less than two cards, you draw two cards. So this is not a deck builder where you just fly through your deck multiple times. So that's why I think people have kind of a rub with this game. It's like, is it really a deck builder? Aren't you supposed to like float through your deck a lot of times? Yes, in the classic sense, but it doesn't feel like it. You may see your awesome cards maybe twice. And if you buy them towards the end of the game, you're going to buy it, use it, and then not going to see it. So... 
that might be a little bit of barrier to the game, but just to let you know, that's kind of how the game plays. So how is this game cooperative? Uh, the game is cooperative because not only can you use your cards to beat the monster in front of you, you can use the mo- you can use your cards to beat other monsters. So let's say you you're the tank and you can take a couple of hits, but your next person is the wizard. You're probably going to want to kill that monster that's attacking the wizard, so you can play all of your cards over to that monster, run through his row of symbols, and you know eradicate that guy. Take your hit, and then the, the wizard is free to kind of do what wizards do, which is you know pew pew and <laughs> uh, not take a lot of hits. So there's the strategy is that way. There's also a system of cards where uh, it's called assisting, where you can use cards out of turn so that you like basically. So it's not like a deck builder where you're having this own solitaire experience. You're really looking at the other players, and if you're playing solo, you're probably playing with at least two characters. Uh, maybe you can go all the way up to the four. And you're really looking over all over the board. You're helping people. That part is really, really tactical. You're identifying threats. You're looking at, oh, uh, there, there's, this monster here is going to you know, do some serious damage to me, but that monster has a global effect that is nerfing all of our powers by one. And, you know, so that that tactical kind of involvement is, is, is pretty much why you play this game. A very, very tactical game. Maybe more ta- way more tactical than a legendary type thing. So it probably has a little bit of a better reputation among gamers, at least the system uh, for that stuff. Um, the last thing to know about the, um, the game is that there's a Dragonfire deck, which is a global effect deck. The which is always nasty, <laughs> unless you get really lucky and you get something that doesn't apply to your um, your party. Um, but you're gonna get like a, some sort of global effect that's gonna affect everybody. Uh, so maybe all ma- martial monsters, like you know, big black monsters like stone giants and stuff, they're all more powerful. Or you get less money uh, for a certain round or whatever. The more of the dragon fire cards you get into the discard deck, the more powerful the enemies become. So if you have six, seven cards in discard deck, means you're taking a long time to get to the dungeon. Yeah, you're probably in trouble. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and so that's kind of how the game kind of sets a timer on it. So you really have to be uh, tight tactically. You have to be, really know what cards are in the discard. You can't just, like, look at it. Like, you know, maybe in, like, Ascension, you can kind of take a card. It looks like fun and you play it, and it does a thing, and you might win. In this game, you really have to know what each card does, how it plays, uh, identify uh, um, certain threats, uh, when to kill those threats. Uh, how much you know co- uh, communicate about who can kill what and all that kind of stuff. That's that's kind of, like I'm leading right into the positives. Like that's why you play Dragonfire. That level of tactical skill is just it probably is more than any deck builder. And I love Aeon's End. Uh, I'll get to a comparison with Aeon's End in a second. But I have to I have to say that in terms of the tactical gameplay, this game probably either matches or maybe exceeds it by a little bit. Uh, uh, Colin, I know you've played both Dragonfire and Aeon's End. What do you think? You are just hitting it on the spot, Jason. I mean, you're you're exactly what exactly what I was thinking. Is that's right. That, that's right. That's why game, you come to this podcast. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you and I just are on the same page because it, it's it's not really a deck builder. You call it a deck builder because you're you're adding cards to your deck of cards, and you will be putting them in the discard pile after you play them. Blah blah blah. But really, it's a tactical experience because what you're trying to do is look at the enemies on the board and figure out which one's going to cause the most damage to the team, not to you, to the team, and then find ways to eliminate it before it activates. Because you can play with the fact that the only enemy that will activate or enemies are the ones that are in front of you at the end of your turn. So you can play the push game where you could push the enemies around and so then when nobody's in front of you when you activate or you can push it all onto the tank and the tank's turn is not for three more people and so then that means you've got three rounds you can hammer those guys and nobody takes damage. You know, this it's just a fantastic way of providing a tactical experience with simple cards and that's why I've loved Shadowrun Crossfire and now with the D&D I'm, I much prefer the fantasy theme than the Shadowrun theme and the art don't even get me started on what the art and the cards look like on Shadowrun Crossfire it looks <laughs> so much better with Dragonfire so I'm loving that game right now lots of fun yeah um, but what about the comparison to Aeon's End oh yeah I'm sorry so for, for Aeon's End versus Dragonfire I uh, Tactical, I would definitely say Dragonfire feels much more tactical. Aeon's End is much more about how you build your deck and being the most efficient with your deck. And 
Dragonfire is much more about what card do I need now to purchase to get into my hand so next time I can be able to manipulate the board in a specific way. So I would I would put Aeon Zen more in the strategic standpoint, and I would put, and it's more about your deck building, and Dragonfire much more about the tactic, tactical, where are the enemies, how do we move them around, how do we utilize where they are? Yeah, well, I, I guess, yeah, I, I, maybe not, that, 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 I, that's a good way to put it, Colin. Um, I think that they're both different flavors of tactics, I shouldn't like compare one to the other, uh, but I think they're both the best in show for the deck building class. I know people are loving on Legendary Alien and, you know, whatever. In terms of a next level uh, engagement, I would take either of these two games. Um, yes, the D&D theme really does it for me, I'm a D&D guy, I love it. Um, there is more mechanical innovation in this game. Like Shadowrun was kind of the beginning, and then they do a lot more. So this game is not simpler. It is not simpler than <laughs> Shadowrun. It, in some ways, it's more complicated. Um, but I think the the changes are good. I can go into it, but I, I think just go into the game, go into the box. There's a lot of gameplay content in the base box. Sometimes you buy some of these expandable card games, and you wonder is there if there's enough gameplay in the base box. Don't worry. There's a plenty. There's campaigns in it. There's lots of different classes, lots of stickers, tons of stickers to level up. I haven't even gotten to the campaign. You can level up and beat better monsters, um, ha- uh, face higher level campaigns. Um, I, I I really enjoyed the game. I'm keeping it around. Um, I think it's still on the difficult side, like you know, to the point where it could be a little bit frustrating. Like uh, if you're not if you're not perfect with your tactics. Uh, and there's certain scenarios, uh, not to spoil the scenarios, but there's certain scenarios where you kind of have to know them and buy the perfect card for that scenario in order to beat it, which I don't like when games do that. Like, you know, I, I don't, I just want to be able to play well and do it as opposed to go fail and then realize, oh, I should have bought this card. Maybe some people might have that fun though. So I, I do want to point out that, you know, that's a thing that what, that's how this game does difficulty, especially for campaigns. Uh, so I didn't love that. You might, um, it's still lucky. <laughs> you might get hosed. You might have a, a game where just like all the all the monsters just kind of fall at your feet. Uh, you might have a game where like you know eleven ropers come out with like ten hit points, which is huge for a first level party, and you just can't do anything. Uh, the the dragonfire deck is a little bit lucky that you're going to hear that a lot. Like you know, I think Anthony says that a lot when he talks about co ops. Sometimes difficult is the same as lucky, which is you know it's like a dodge on difficult. <laughs> Um, so, you know, so that's what, that's kind of a criticism that have the game. They've not fixed that, but I think over the, the life of enough plays, uh, and it's still enjoyable enough to kind of overcome that. I have to give this game a recommendation. Uh, that's Dragonfire. All right. So one game I did get a chance to play, uh, after some time, it's been sitting on my shelf for a little while, but I did get a chance to play it and that's Massive Darkness. This is the most recent big box Kickstarter release from Simon. Uh, it's from the... Uh, some of the designers and the the people behind uh, Zombicide, um, and it, it looks and feels very similar to Zombicide, and, and you'll notice that just by looking at it or looking at the back of the box. You have the um, same kind of miniatures and the layout of the tiles and the, the dashboards um, that they had in the most recent versions of that game. So this one, however, takes place in a medieval world, um, has a little bit of Black Plague crossover, but that's mostly a, a marketing ploy. Uh, and you are going on different quests and trying to complete these different missions and fighting these different fantasy themed monsters. You have your minotaurs and your goblins and your dwarves. Uh, don't, and don't sound so excited. No, no, no. I mean, it's <laughs> your minotaurs and your goblins. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's one of those things like at this point, if you're going to do high fantasy, you need a little bit of a spin on it. And I think narratively and thematically the game on its face at least is just kind of the stuff you'd expect with a few fun exceptions because that's what you get in a kickstarter um artistically some very cool stuff but thematically it's it's high fantasy so you the core game comes with six heroes um and a pretty good number of monsters that you're going to face off against um every character is going to have their own dashboard which will track your xp your hit points and then you'll have one slot for armor two slots for weapons you don't need to play all six characters like you would in Zombie Side if you're going to play it solo, which is cool. Uh, if you ever played Zombie Side solo, it's a little hard to wrap your head around all the different characters because you can't really, it doesn't really scale down to one. Um, even if you're playing with four people, you still need all six of those characters out there somehow. This one can do one. Um, there's some issues with that, which we'll get to. 
The you're also going to get a character sheet for your class. So there's different um, classes to choose from, and these generally fall along those same fantasy lines. Although they have some kind of funny names to them, like Bone Crusher, which is really just you know the Berserker Warrior, whatever it is. Um, but each of these has their own kind of special signature abilities and some passive abilities, and then a whole bunch of different level up options. So you're going to spend XP as you play through the game, and you're going to unlock different abilities that make you more powerful as you go along based on where you are in that particular mission. So the gameplay itself um, will sound very familiar to you if you've played any dungeon crawl, especially Zombicide. You will activate your hero and do one of a few things. You either move, fight, trade or reorganize your stuff, um, get up if you got stunned somehow, or pass. Uh, if you move, you have two movement points. You can move between zones, open a door, or pick up some stuff. And the stuff you might pick up, there's treasure chests and all sorts of other like you know, mission specific stuff on the ground. You also have a couple free actions at any time during your turn, you can transmute, which allows you to turn three equipment cards that you're not using into one slightly better equipment card. So you just upgrade those three from the lowest level of the three cards to the next one up. And then you have your signature ability, which you can do once per activation. Um, you have to spend experience points to do it, but you get a ton of experience points, so not a big deal. The enemies, very, very, very basic. They will try to attack you if you're in range, then they'll move, then try to attack, and then they move again, the end. Nothing super fancy there. Um, <laughs> some of them have you know, special abilities, I think they're called enchantments, that'll trigger based on dice rolls, but for the most part, if they're in range, they're gonna attack you. If not, you can avoid them. Then you spend any XP that you built up during the round, uh, you can upgrade your skills, you can hold on to it, but eventually if you cap out, then you're just wasting you know, your, your track there, so you want to spend it where you can. And then the event phase, at the very end of every activation, you're going to draw an event card and resolve it, and this might do one of several things, but the most interesting is usually moving or drawing a new roaming monster. Uh, the roaming monsters come from one of two decks based on what level you're at, so these are just like standalone, kind of the more fun monsters that come in the game. So unicorns and all that crazy stuff. And those are probably the more interesting enemies that you're gonna face, to be honest. Um, combat, also fairly simple. You're gonna add up the dice that you get to roll based on the icons on your skill sheet and your weapons or your armor. Um, you can only roll three of any one type of dice at a time. And there's two types of dice for each of attack and defense. So you could theoretically have six dice that you're rolling. Um, Defender does the same thing, compare hits to blocks see who wins. When you encounter a door, um, you will spend a movement point to unlock it. You draw a door card. The door card tells you how many enemies are going to be in that room, plus how many treasure chests. This is an interesting part for me because the treasure chests don't scale to player count. So if you're playing by yourself and you open a door and there's nine treasure chests in there, you're getting all that treasure, which is pretty cool, except then you have a ton of stuff and you, you can trade that in and level it up and get some higher powered gear pretty early on, um, which is fun, but at the same time, bogs down the difficulty a little bit. There's a campaign mode in here too, that kind of uh, scales down the XP a little bit. So you get micro XP and you don't get the XP quite as fast. You don't turn into this godlike character, you know, in 35 minutes. Um, you still do pretty quickly though. It's, you get a lot of XP when you're playing solo. So. I don't know, the stuff I liked here, uh, I, I did legitimately like the flow of the game. It has that kind of arcade-like feel where you're getting tons of cards and killing lots of monsters, picking up all this loot. Um, so it's fun to have this god mode character who can just mow stuff down. That's cool. Miniatures are great. Setting is fun, even though it's, you know, a lot of generic high fantasy, but it's kind of a cool take on that aesthetically. You know, I like the miniature design. I like the graphic design here. It all looks nice. Um, and the game plays fairly quickly with a couple of exceptions. Now, the stuff I don't like, uh, it so it plays quickly, right, until it doesn't. So you can get stuck pretty easily. Uh, you can get a drag. You know, your enemy has a ton of armor. And you just keep pinging each other back and forth. You can't move away. So you're just waiting and waiting. And maybe, you know, maybe you also have plenty of armor, so they're not really hurting you. Or maybe you have healing or regeneration. And so it just kind of goes and goes and goes. Um, the... The fact that it ramps up so quickly, especially in the arcade mode, makes it way too easy. Way, way too easy. <laughs> this game, I I think the first two or three missions, I took maybe one or two hits, period. It's very 
simple to level yourself up and trade up your gear enough to get to the point where you're rolling four, five, six dice on your turn for both attack or defense. And depending on your character you know, sheet that you pulled, you know, maybe even some bonuses beyond that. Um, the loot not scaling to less players is a problem, I think. So that could probably house ruled, but it's something to keep in mind. And the, I don't know, man, it's just, I got bored <laughs> by the time, anytime you're up, you know, you're going up to level four and five, the game's fine up to level three, but once you hit four and five, it's just, you just, you know, you're going to win. You're just kind of going through the motions to get to the end. And it loses that kind of initial charm uh, of those fun things that you're doing. So while it's fun to kind of grind for loot and build yourself up quickly at a certain point, you kind of want to get hit, I guess. <laughs> That's the best way to put it. Um, and you don't. So it's it's not like Zombicide where you have a little bit more challenge, things come at you a little bit harder. Uh, this game ends up being just a little too easy for my for my taste. Colin, you did the playthrough. Yeah, 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 I did. Um, you, you call this a popcorn game. Yes, uh, a beer and pretzels game. Beer and pretzels. Uh, yeah, there you go. beer and pretzels. Some snack. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's very much. I, I enjoyed it, but it's not one that I kept in my collection because if I'm gonna play a dungeon crawler, I I'd like to have a challenge, and it's definitely a challenge if you play it with maybe four or five characters and you're looking to slog through a lot of dice chucking with very minimal that you can do to, to, to make a difference with your dice rolls. Uh, but if I'm going to do something like that, I'd prefer Sword and Sorcery, or I would prefer even Gloomhaven, which provides you with a little bit more strategic decision-making. Um, but this one's great for if you're looking for something light and you enjoy the theme and you enjoy really nice-looking minis, because the minis do look very, very nice, and if you paint them up, Ooh, wow, they're going to look fantastic on your board. Um, but I don't know if you guys noticed when you were playing it, but whenever you would draw a mob card, and you'd have to put out eight of those miniatures, right? And it'd be all the little minis with one of the boss dudes. And, and you would roll the same amount of dice for that as you would roll when you've defeated all the little small minions except for the one elite guy. It just didn't make any sense to me. All it was was those those little miniature minions are basically like hit points for the main elite guy and i just it bugged me <laughs> yes, you know yeah. make them make them work <laughs> something other than just a hit point my goodness i mean not they didn't even make it make the uh the elite guy roll any more dice it was just they were there and so then i had to spend all the time pulling them out and then taking them off the board anyways it just yeah it Overall, it was not my type of game, but I can certainly see people that would enjoy it if you're looking for something light and fun. And you know what? If you have kids, I bet you anything the kids would enjoy this. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I think for me, I was disappointed because, like you said, I want to challenge. I want to be able to think. I want to have ways to mitigate stuff. And I didn't think about it that way as like the minions being hit points for the boss, but you're 100% right. That's exactly what it is. Um, and I think that's why I played at lower character counts because I didn't like just all these minis on the board, all these minis off the board, all these minis on the board, all these minis off <laughs> exactly the board. Exactly it. Yes. Uh, but yeah, if you're if you're dealing with people who like don't play board games very much or kids, um, you know, I could totally see my kids graduating from Mice and Mystics or Imperial Assault up, you know, not not Imperial Assault, but Mice and Mystics up through a game like this that's not not necessarily overly complicated or you know scary or gross like Zombie Side or something like that. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a game you'd play when you're not paying attention to what you're doing. I don't know, like, what's the target audience here for these guys? Um, and the, the target the audience is me fans. That's it. Yeah, like, that's. I am totally. not paying a hundred dollars to have to eat beard pretzels and play with my, you know, if I'm gonna play a kids game, I'm gonna play um, Mice and Mystics or Stuff Fables is coming soon. Not pulling this out. Yeah, and it's not a kids game at all. It's just in terms of like mechanics, it's. It's kids at that mechanics. level. Yeah, exactly. It's it's very, very basic stuff. But I don't know. I, I feel like they positioned it as kind of a step up or forward uh, from like the zombie side system. And it's really not. It's like a lateral step and honestly kind of takes a couple things away by trying to make it more like arcadey. Trying to make they're trying to empower the the players and the characters to like look how much cool stuff you're doing, but in the end it's almost on rails. All right. So um I wanted to use Massive Darkness to, to launch our little mini discussion on miniatures in board games. A couple of us like that are making uh, content for solo and co-op and some other people, uh, we're in a kind of shared discussion group. And 
had a very interesting discussion. I wanted to kind of put it out there and see what you guys thought and see what the larger audience thought as well. Um, so we're talking with Anthony from Ant Lab Games, and he mentioned that he didn't, he'd never played Gloomhaven. And we're like, what? <laughs> you know, how, what? That, that game is like the game of the year for some people. And he's like, it doesn't have minis. I'm not doing it. Or the, the monster standees, like the monsters don't have minis. And he was just adamant about it. And eventually we kind of warmed down where he's like, maybe, which I think he just said that to end conversation. I think he's like, no, we're not, I'm not doing it. Um, so that was interesting to me. Like, it, it's funny to begin with, but like, it just kind of raised the question for me of how necessary are miniatures in these adventure games. Is it going to be like you look at an adventure game and it, and quote unquote has to have minis and you know it, like no substitutes uh, required? Like, what are you guys ultimately thinking, Anthony? I wanted to know your thoughts because I know you back Massive Darkness because of the minis. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have problems, guys. I got problems. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's tough because I feel like the miniatures to some degree justify the cost of some of these big box games i know they also contribute to that cost to some degree but they're not as expensive as you might expect them to be to produce if you're producing them in mass um and so if you're getting this big epic thematic experience you kind of want to have that three-dimensional piece that goes with it you know it's got the toy factor right and i like to paint stuff and i don't do it nearly as much as i should or would need to to catch up to the collection of miniatures i have but it's cool to kind of make it your own and have the ability to make it your own uh, in a way that you can't do with cardboard. You're not going to like paint over the cardboard and change the colors or update the artwork or anything like that. At the same time, a game like Gloomhaven, I I was, I backed the first Kickstarter. They had two options. You could get standees for the characters or miniatures. And of course I picked the miniatures. Um, But the, the enemies, that was not an option because there were, dozens of enemies and that game would have cost so much money and it would have taken so long to produce and i think in that case first of all having played that game a lot i know you know it doesn't matter thematically i don't feel any difference playing that versus if they have miniatures in it but secondarily that's a game with a ton of content regardless of miniatures so they're not using the miniatures as a crutch the content is in the cardboard so i think there's kind of two ways to look at it you know you get the thematic boost and you've also got it kind of kind of filling it out a little bit like a game like massive darkness there's not a lot of game here without the miniatures a game like gloomhaven it doesn't need them because it has so much game so like you talked about the toy factor right that is that the most that we could say about a miniatures game like that's why miniatures game is good because of that pop the 3d the toy factor uh yeah i guess it depends on the game i think in the case of like massive darkness for example it's fun and forgettable but the miniatures push it over the edge for some people uh for other games they do feel integral it does feel like a big part of it and kind of the three-dimensional aspect of moving those things around you know depends on how much you move them and you know what you're doing with them and how you're engaging with them um but yeah at the end of the day there's that little kick of dopamine in the back of your brain when you're like i'm playing with toys (laughs) so (laughs) yeah uh you get your minis painted right uh colin uh yeah some of them not all of them but uh definitely do some of them and i have to say that you know if you think of a game like runebound Right, if you're playing Roombound, and if you notice, only the heroes have miniatures. All of the enemies are just cards, right? And it it works well because if if I was just a a card or a cardboard chit for Roombound, I don't think you would feel as much of like you're part of that world as you do when you have the miniature. So I I totally understand where Anthony is coming from in that. When you have miniatures on the board, it feels more real because it's a 3D piece of of um, plastic that you can kind of pretend that you are that. But the issue is when you decide <laughs> that after you've played games with miniatures, that then games without miniatures are not worth your time. And I think that's what the, the biggest issue for me is, because even though a game doesn't have miniatures, it can actually be a fantastic game, like Gloomhaven. It, it, you don't need the miniatures. They certainly help with you getting into 
the game itself, but they're not needed. And I don't know about you guys, but if you don't get your miniatures painted, sometimes the cardboard uh, the cardboard standees are nice because they're painted, they're colored, uh, you know, because they're printed. And so it actually pops more on your board because they're colored instead of having all these gray, gray pieces everywhere. So, you know, in some ways... Some games, I actually like the standees better than a miniature because they're already colored and they, they bring color to the board itself. Yeah, yeah that's so a really I, good point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, so I, I'm guessing, like, just to sum up the pro side, to speak for good old Anthony from Ad Lab Games, uh, I, I, I need a name for him because like, we have two Anthony. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> too many of you guys. Um, okay, so there's the toy factor, that dopamine kick that Anthony was talking about. Uh, there's that immersion factor that Colin was talking about, like, you know, kind of getting into the world helps you kind of do that more. I've also heard that, like, and, and it makes sense from, like, thinking about war games and why, you know, a lot of, like, different war gamers are, like, even real-life generals who used to make, you know, big tables with very realistic figures on them. Like, it's almost like you can play better. Like, you can tactically immerse yourself in a game especially if the game kind of rewards that right so uh a game like massive darkness you don't need to you know <laughs> invest yourself tactically but like if you're playing like a really involved game uh where tactics you know uh, the grid tactics are very very important it's at you know and i'm talking about the b- the bigger more advanced war games we're using those little brooms to you know move um units across the field and all that kind of stuff you can actually play better if you can imagine yourself in that scenario. So, um, you know, and also think like Warhammer and all those like kind of bigger games like that. So really there is a lot to say about miniatures. So, and, and I definitely want to put that all out there, but we do have a game like Massive Darkness. And I think a very valid criticism is that because the miniatures are so good and detailed and fun, they were able to get away with putting out kind of a substandard mechanical experience where let's say, you know, there's a certain amount of dev time that's developed to a board game and then you can put in more dev time to make a better game, but you can also give the the dev time for minis uh, some time and then you can just kind of have two parallel tracks, one making the game, one making the minis, and you end up with a kind of a half-baked game that sells because of minis. And I know some people kind of on the other side of the argument are saying, oh, you know, this is bad for board gaming. I mean, this is bad. Maybe that's like more of a purist thing. Um, But like, you know, all these minis, these infusion of minis is stilting the progress of games. Like they're relying on minis in order to be good. And something of the craft, especially in certain Kickstarter projects, has been lost. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts about that. Yeah, man. I think two things I thought about that uh, based on what you're saying is, Masmora, we talked about this way earlier in 2017, but that's a great example of this as well, where the game is not very good, but it sold a bunch on Kickstarter because of the minis they put in and the Arcadia Quest crossover stuff. Um, to the point, several people I know picked it up, ripped out the miniatures, tossed the game in the closet and forgot about it. So, <laughs> in the closet, just throwing the trash at that point. Yeah, it's just not, not that great of a game. It's kind of on par with this one in terms of like, it's fine, it's forgettable, I'm not going to play it anymore. Another point, too, I want to bring up about uh, Gloomhaven is that that game originally in its first printing didn't have a ton of backers. I think there was only, it might have had $300,000 or something, which considering what that game has become is kind of crazy, right? I think a huge part of that is because it didn't have all those miniatures. If it had been a game with like 150 miniatures, then I think it would have gotten all that backing. But the game showed that the miniatures aren't necessary and the time went into actually developing a solid game. And then once people knew about that from that first wave of people talking about how great it is, then they jumped on and nobody cared about the miniature issue. Um, Then it made $4 million, whatever it did, the second Kickstarter. So I think it's a good point because it can go both ways. You can have people taking advantage of this kind of collection toy factor craze. Um, I've certainly fallen victim to it several times in recent years of, "Ah, I want the game because of the minis, but I don't know if the game's any good. Why am I backing this in? Um, but at the same time, people who bypass the minis and say, I'm just going to focus on the game, their projects might suffer because people aren't, it doesn't have that big glaring thing attracting people to it. So it's it's kind of a tough place that people get stuck in. So, it you know, I kind of see your point and um, understand why there could be some concern there about the, how the hobby is moving. And it seems to me, I don't know about you guys, but it seems to be the biggest issue is with Kickstarter, right? So, Mm -hmm, you know, um, people want to get their games funded, and so they think to get their games funded, 
minis equals funding because people will back it purely because of the minis. And so does that is that a bad thing? Is that a good thing? Well, I think that's your own personal choice or own own personal opinion on if that's a good or a bad thing. But it is one of the things that drives people to back a game. And if that means a game that is good that normally wouldn't have maybe been people would have backed it, but then decided to back it because of the miniatures, and then it turns out it is a great game. That's the other the other flip side of that is that can help uh, make a game or have a game be created that normally wouldn't be able to because of the minis. So you can have it go the other way as well. I, I definitely, I guess my, my stance on it is that I agree with the stance that minis kind of enhance the game experience, not just like in a surface level way, which is really important. Like, you know, I, I'm all about like that dopamine kick. I'm all about like having fun and they, we're playing games. We're kind of, we're not like, you know, curing cancer <laughs> or doing anything really serious. We're just playing games and we're doing it having fun. I don't want I don't want to diminish that, but I think that there is kind of this tactical richness. There's a thematic immersion experience, all that stuff, good stuff we talked about, and I think that gamers have come to expect that. And I think that, and that's what gets us excited. And I think that companies are looking at going, okay, let me. Some companies, I shouldn't say all of them, but I think some companies have kind of got some stuff in there where it's like, okay, let me take advantage of people's probably valid desire for miniatures. And let me put out a product that I didn't put as much dev time into, um, and I'll sell it because of that miniature thing. So it's like it's almost like kind of the, the pro side kind of attracted <laughs> this uh, con you know thing where like okay I just gonna let me just get a half baked game out there. So I don't know. Um, I I don't really know the answer. I guess a, a, a game like Gloomhaven or I can't really think of another one. I maybe like a, a game like Gloom of Killforth, but doesn't rely like there's like there's all miniature I think. But doesn't rely on miniatures. I like. I think that's kind of what a sweet spot is, where you know, where there is a lot of depth time in there, and the minis are there as a kind of enhancement. Um, but it isn't the main show, um, and that's and that's probably the sweet spot. Yeah. So uh, I guess that that's where we come uh, when it comes to miniatures. I hope you guys got a sense for like you know some of the pros and the cons. And um, if you have any uh, thoughts about miniatures games, um, you know, we're always like I I got this idea not only from the conversation we had with Ant Lab, but also there was a thread. Uh, there was one person that just like posted and said, uh, "Look at this awesome game! Has no miniatures whatsoever. Look, you know, there should be no uh, get the miniatures out of my games." And there was a conversation based on that. So we're always talking about this kind of stuff. Uh, we're willing to have a lot more of these conversations on the podcast as we hear about them or read about them on Facebook or BGG. For sure, guys. Yeah. So if you have not yet, make sure you connect with us in all the different places we hang out. Um, you can catch us on Facebook, uh, the Board Gamers Anonymous page, as well as the Solo Gaming Group there. Um, the solo guild over on board game geek um, every night is game night.com which is on boardgamersanonymous.com and then of course on twitter at engn underscore podcast check us out in all these various places let us know what you think conversations like this turn into episodes all the time we produce every week guys we need content ideas <laughs> where do you think it comes from um so yeah, that's everything for this week. Colin, once again, thank you so much for stopping by. Really appreciate your input and kind of hanging out with us. My pleasure. All right, guys. So that is everything for this week. Until next week, go ahead and grab a solo game off the shelf and let's make every night game night. Later, everybody. <laughs>